To become an American, to be an American, means accepting these self-evident truths. And now it is very popular to believe, you know, for an Israeli coming to America, this is always stunning. Because you hear, I, I was a, an, a, an assistant, a teacher's assistant at Rutgers University, which is, by the way, the most diverse, is in the middle of the most diverse county in the whole union, in, in New Jersey. And, and you hear people there telling you, uh, college kids, that they believe that each and every person has the right to believe in her or his own values. And they hardly notice that this is already a great shared consensus. That already in this is individualism, equality, gender equality, the rest of it. And no one in America is allowed to believe otherwise when it comes to fundamentals. This told me once very clearly a uh, um, retired uh, Jewish federal judge in a, in a community named Great Neck. Uh, in Long Island where Jews are not starving. <laughs> and, and he said, he said, look, a guy came to me, I don't want to mention what nation is uh, his wife, and he came from, with a lawyer from Berkeley who said, well, you know, in our culture it's different, it's good for her, all that. And he said, look, if it's your culture, go back to your own country, do that here, it's against the law. So the set of values Americans already <laughs> share is vast enough for them to believe that everyone can believe in their own values so long as they subscribe to ABCD. <laughs> I can tell you what ABCD is, but I won't repeat it again. This society is an immigrant society, like America is. We forget in Israel and America that this is the exception, not the rule. This is a very strange kind of, of society. And if one wants to go to the bottom of the difference between such societies and, I'll call them normal national societies for our purposes, then if in a normal society, say England, France, the principle of unity, what makes people feel they are a we, us, is the experience of a common past. I'm stressing each and every word of this. Experience in the immediate sense of a common past. Immigrant societies don't have that. Their immediate experience is not of a common past. So their principle of unity lies rather in a plan for a common future. Uh, and this is a very crucial difference. The idea of emancipation in Europe was to turn the Jews into citizens like all other citizens, like this succeeded in America to a great extent. And so they were to become Jew, uh, uh, Germans of Jewish faith, or Frenchmen of Jewish faith, or Englishmen <coughs> of Jewish faith. But this didn't work, because it turned out that being privately Jewish and publicly <coughs> German or English or French somehow didn't, um, uh, somehow one couldn't reconcile the two poles of this um, formula or the two parts of this identity. And some of the reasons are very trivial. If you're Jewish and you go to a German school, then the day of rest is Sunday, and then you're, you can't. Shmuel Shabbat. Um, the food is not kosher. But perhaps even more disturbing, uh, because this goes also to secular Jewish identity, is the fact that you study history in a national state like Germany, and the Germans have a shared past, um, an experience, and a tradition that makes them German. And so you study that your ancestors were barbarian tribes who invaded the Roman Empire. And this means giving up your own ancestors and giving up your own tradition. So the fact is not just that the Jews were not accepted into other nations. It is also important to note that they 
found themselves in a situation where they had to give, a lar- give up a large portion of their private Jewish identity in order to become citizens, active citizens, in another nation. Which is just another way to say that there is no formal democracy without nationalism. I've been talking here blue in the mouth to explain to Israelis what seems to me, you know, as a student of American history, is people here believe that America is a non-national state. It's just multicultural. There is no common American identity. And, and trying to explain America without nationalism is, is hopeless. Um, and people believe it's just a formal structure of individual rights and nothing else. But there is no such democracy. Democracy is always supplemented or supported by a sense of attachment. You care about your society. You care about your nation which is why you vote, which is why the whole democratic revolution could have taken place, because people were trusted to vote according to some view of the common good and not just completely egotistically. This is why the rallying cry of both revolutions, the American and the French, was patriot. If you're a patriot, then you're a democrat. If you're not a patriot, you're probably just a traitor. Um, or else you support the English crown or something horrible like that. <laughs> so, in the case of Zionism, people found themselves drawn to this idea because this was the way to reconcile private Jewish identity with public sovereignty. In order to become modern, to become sovereign over your own faith, both as an individual and to take part in the political sphere, which means to be sovereign collectively, you need a Jewish collective. This was the original Zionist conclusion. And this was a very powerful force. And this is why for the ruling party for many years, Mapai, Mifleget Pole Israel, the party of the uh, workers of the land of Israel, the Ben-Gurion's party, um, had a slogan, an election slogan saying, without Cherut and Maki, without the revisionists, Begin, Jabotinsky, and um, the, the extreme right, and without Maki, the communists. Because Cherut, or so it seemed, was an expansionist party ready to um, renounce if not in principle, then de facto the Jewish majority. And hence we're going to lose democracy if the Jews are not going to be a majority. So it would be a Jewish state, but not a democratic state. This is not how Jabotinsky would describe himself, but this is what <coughs> Mapai thought of him. And on the other hand, we had Maki, the communists, who believed in a democracy which would not be Jewish, which would include any uh, cities, any... any uh, anyone residing in the, 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 the territory. So one had to reconcile the two. And this is a simple mathematical problem. You need a Jewish majority to have a Jewish democratic state. It turns into a contradiction in terms when Jews are a minority. This is that simple. This is the overarching, most important fact about Israeli politics from the very beginning and up to this day. And this consensus held more or less until the end of the 60s. At the end of the 60s, um, the most important turning point in Israel's history came about, and this was the lightning victory in the war of 67. But the mood here before the war was there were jokes like, last to leave the state should turn off the light, and things like that. And after the war, there was an unbelievable euphoria. So the euphoria was great, and everybody's head was dizzy. And with the exception of Levi Eshkol and Amos Oz and a few other astute um, observers, we thought that everything's going to be well from now on. Um, and I'm mentioning these two because there are people who said the occupation was going to be a disaster. There were many. But two people noticed the long 
term effect or the overarching problem. And Levi Eshkol phrased it, you know, in a kind of Jewish joke. He said, this is a, a, I, I, I need to know how to say Antonia. Dowry. Dowry, thanks. Uh, he said that the, that the war was, the, the results of the war were like a great wedding. The dowry was just superb, we just don't want the bride. <laughs> and the bride is, of course, the Palestinians. And so he realized there's going to be a conflict here which we can't solve. But Amos Oz wrote a piece two months after the war in Davao. You can still find it in his collection of essays. I think it's called Under This Harsh Azure Light or blazing Under This light. Azure Light. Blazing Light. Blazing Light. Under This Blazing Light. It's, I, I translate it literally. The O Hatchelet Haza. Very nice name. Uh, and he wrote a short piece called The Minister of Defense of the Lebensraum. The Minister of Defense and the Living Territory or Living Space. Living space. This is, the, the term is rang in everybody's ears because it's, he, I said it in German, he said it in Hebrew, but everybody knew Merchav Michia rang from German. And in this piece he said, look, we are going to have to choose. If Zionism is about redeeming the land, We'll keep the territories, but we we'll, won't be a democracy. If it's about liberating people, if it's about sovereignty, we'll have to give up the land. So we have to choose between the two. Um, Israel chose not to choose, but Amos Oz <coughs> drew the map of Israeli politics for many years to come. Society, which is an immigrant society, which, as I said, relies on a plan for a common future, a shared vision of the future, does not have a shared vision of the future. So it's, uh, its very principle of unity is in danger. It's not just an ideological or a political controversy. It's a controversy over what we are, over what this is, over what Zionism is, over what it means to be Israeli and what it means to be Jewish here. And this runs all the way down to a split in people's hearts. Um, and this society has ever since, it's lost, if you forgive me for the very vulgar metaphor, but if you think of this society as a, an immigrant society as a pizza, then what is holding the slices in the middle just burst. And the slices are increasingly drifting apart. I'll tell you a short anecdote I heard from Amos Oz also, uh, because he gave a lecture in Sweden where he laid out his conception of solving the Israeli-Palestinian problem, two-state solution, you know it. At the end of this, some leftist Swede gets up and says, well, Mr. Oz, I've been listening to you for uh, an hour and a half, and your plan makes no sense. It makes no geographical sense. Look at this winding border, this divided state the Palestinians are going to have. It makes no economic sense. This is a tiny tract of land. How are you going to divide the resources? It makes no political sense. Why don't you just have one state for all its citizens? And said, oh, well, you know, I'm looking at this peninsula you share with Norway. And <laughs> it makes no geographical sense. <laughs> it makes no economic sense. You even pray to the same God. You speak close languages. Why don't you have one state of all its citizens? The Swede looks at him with just plain disgust and said, yes, 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 but you don't know the Norwegians. <laughs> so, if, if the Norwegians and the Swedes are not yet ready to transcend nationalism, perhaps it's not a good idea that the Palestinians and Israelis would be the first to, to try that. <laughs> Why Qassam rockets after we left Gaza? Because the radicals are not going to have to let us have partition agreement. This was a, a rocket attack on uh, on realignment, did they call it in English? Mm -hmm. the, on on Olmert's plan, it was called it consul. There's no good word. It's convergence and realignment together. Uh, and they attacked Olmert's plan because this is very logical. If you're, if you're on the Palestinian side and you understand everything that I said, which they do, um, which is that, Zionist, that the Zionist movement is dependent on stable borders with a stable Jewish majority, then what you should do is prevent Israel from achieving that. And 
Israel was going to do that unilaterally on its own and thus save Zionism. They're not going to let us. 